Hello everyone, Steve Edelman, and very importantly, living with type 1 diabetes for 53 years. And my good friend and colleague, Jeremy Pettis, and I've been living for type 1 for about 30 years almost now. Yeah, I'm 67, Jeremy is 43, and the age is important here because we're talking about living longer and aging well with diabetes. Yeah, and so importantly, this isn't a talk about, you know, I'm old and I'm dealing with diabetes. It's across the lifespan. You could be watching this in your, your 15 or, or 25 or 35, but the idea here is that how do we live a long, healthy life? And kind of going on the theme of our conference, kind of how do you play the best hand that you're dealt? And what are some things that you can do to kind of increase your odds, you know, of living a long and healthy life? And a key thing that we're always gonna come back to is starting early. You know, it's never, t like, you can't do these things soon enough to improve your overall life and health. You're right. You know, when I was thinking about this presentation that we're about to give you, I'm thinking of three buckets. You know, people that are really young, you know, you're you think you're invincible, you jump out of an airplane with your diabetes, you know, hopefully you got a parachute. But people that are middle-aged, like Jeremy. Thanks. You're the kind of folks that I think should will, will pay attention to the important parts of this presentation. And if you're older, like myself, slightly older, um, it's never too late and you can always improve uh, your risk factors for things that get worse as you get older. So it's really important starting mm -hmm. early. So the first, you know, we put it like Steve actually put this together and had these main kind of buckets or, or topics that we wanted to talk about. Tips for kind of like success. And number one shouldn't be, you know, too big of a, su a surprise, but it's, it's exercise. And specifically how you can use exercise throughout your life um, to uh, keep in shape, keep healthy, and how that might change over time, what you actually do. Yeah, you know, I'm a good example of that because um, I used to play pickup basketball until, until I tore my ACL. You know, I used to ride a skateboard when I was a kid, fell a zillion times, but going to have my knee replacement in a few weeks. Um, and I think it's just important to know staying active is extremely important, you know, getting your heart rate up and doing it for an extended period of time. But you may have to change the things you do over time. And I think uh, you mentioned you play pickleball now instead of tennis. Is that right? Well, I never really <laughs> played either, but, you know, I think that's, that's just a good example. So what I did used to do is I used to run a lot. Um, and then, you know, my, my feet, actually it was mostly my feet would hurt and not my knees so much, but it evolved and now I do, you know, cycle, spin, things like that. Um, because it, I've realized how important it is, not for just for blood sugars, but just feeling sane. If I don't exercise for like a week, I'm just like, I just don't feel as well. You know, and, and a, we both have Pelotons, doesn't matter which brand you have. Um, and, you know, getting aerobic exercise, and it's all, also very safe and mm -hmm. good for the knees, and a treadmill at home where you may want to just walk and put it on a on an incline. So the things you do really has to be individual. You know, what if you're 80 years old and, and you like to ski? If you're an expert skier, it's probably the safest thing you could do. But don't go out and start skiing when you've never skied before unless you want to come home on a stretcher. Um, but I, I have to say the quote from a good friend and colleague, um, who said, who's an exercise physiologist, type one himself, Larry Verity. Uh, it's the greatest quote. If you do not find time for exercise, you'll have to find time for disease. And I, I can't think of a better thing to start early in your life. But once again, you can't just buy spandex and go to the gym on January 5th because you're all motivated. You got to do something that you like. You yeah. can continue to wear the spandex. Thank though. you. Um, and, you know, if you're listening and saying, gosh, I don't pellet, I don't do these things, like, you know, that's just, that's it. It doesn't have to be all of a sudden I should be, you know, doing a marathon. Finding something that you enjoy, um, you know, 30 minutes a day, a couple times a week makes a big difference. And it's all about moving. It really is kind of like use it or lose it. And if you're not up active doing something, um, it, it kind of, it can, your health can deteriorate over time. Yeah, and this relates to some of our other five topics, which is cardiovascular disease, uh, sexual health as well. And um, we've asked a lot of our older patients to talk about what are the secrets about living a long and healthy life with diabetes. And I love this, I love this one. Uh, expect your body to change <laughs> and not always for the better. Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of accept, you know, when you look in the mirror, you go, oh my God. <laughs> but staying healthy and staying active does so many good things for you. Yeah, we both actually have joined the YMCA and kind of independently of each other. And I think we kind of came to it because I've joined many different gyms over my years. And it was, you know, a lot of them can be kind of a scene. 
Like people are going there to like kind of this pickup place. We found a place that's comfortable. You know, like the YMCA, I just feel like, you know, like there's a lot of people there just kind of interested in health, family. So find a place like, to exercise that feels good, not just to exercise, but also you feel comfortable in whatever space you're doing it. I think it's so important. Yeah, now one of the things I'm really sad about is that Jeremy and I used to wrestle for exercise mm -hmm. and he got hurt. Mm -hmm. So take a look. <laughs> hey, I'm surprised you showed. Absolutely, you know, I wrestled in high school. What? You didn't tell me that. You didn't ask. All right, you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to do this? I guess. All right, ready? On the count of three. Okay. One, two. Jeez. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm getting low. My blood sugar's low. Gosh, sorry. Let me get you some. Yeah, juice. yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Kidding! Woohoo! I win! Yeah, so Steve clearly cheats usually when he <laughs> wrestles, and um, we do that every other Tuesday. Um, and sometimes, like, we, we shift it to Wednesday, but we, we try to fit in a good wrestling session every now and then. But, um, so also, if you follow us at TCOID, we do a lot of what we call these challenges. Um, Steve and I challenged each other to eat, you know, three uh, donuts uh, and try to stay uh, keep our blood sugar in range, three pieces of pizza. But we also did an exercise challenge um, where I was actually on a Peloton and Steve was walking for 45 minutes to show how to plan for exercise, um, what to do during exercise and after exercise with your blood sugars. So again, you can get you can do it successfully. So take a little uh, view of one of the clips here. We're halfway through, 22 minutes. My blood sugar is 129, diagonal up. And eating that whole half sandwich, it's finally sinking in. And you know what, it's just Murphy's Law. Uh, it's always tough to eat the right amount of food when you think you might get low. And um, I'm not sure, but in a few minutes, if it doesn't flatten out, I'm gonna turn off my pump setting so it goes back to a goal of 120 and, and turn off the uh, reduction in insulin. You know, and I am now at 240. So am I happy about that? Absolutely not. But it just goes to show you, I'm an endocrinologist. I know a lot about diabetes. I've been planning ahead for this for like a month and still, you know, can't get in range. The great thing about that video, Jeremy, was that I started off low, ended up high. Jeremy started off high, ended up low. And the most feedback we got from our viewers Hey, you guys are normal too. Yeah. And, and if you have type one, that's probably the hardest thing to do to keep your blood sugars normal is exercise. Yeah, I mean, we gave a ton of tips and it all just went to hell pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's part of the point is that, you know, even if like you plan as much as possible, it can still be difficult. Um, it doesn't mean don't do it. It's just that you're not alone if you're struggling with, um, you know, when to exercise, how to exercise, all those things. So as we mentioned, Steve and I have been living with type one for a long time, but guess what? There's a lot of you listening that have been living with type one for years. So we went out and found some of our patients that have been living with type one for over 50 years, 50 years, and asked them some of their kind of pearls of wisdom of, of how to live a long and healthy life. And this first clip is from somebody you know well named Judith. Judith Ambrosia, she's a, she's a delightful woman. She's an author. She's been involved in our TCOID conferences. And she actually runs, um, I can't remember which exercise class she did, but it was like Pilates on the grass at the Paradise Point Hotel. Let's hear what she has to say. So the question is, challenges, aging and diabetes and the challenges it presents. First of all, the whole idea of aging is, seems very rude to me. I don't like it. Aging with diabetes has kind of slowed me down a little bit. Um, and that is a challenge. I still take uh, Tai Chi, I take aerobic dance, I do stretch classes. I used to do Zumba, now I do Zumba Gold. But the whole idea is to keep moving and it's so important to move every day. So that would be the answer to that challenge. The other challenge I feel is that I'm really tired of having diabetes. I've been living with it for 62 out of my 70 blah, blah, blah years. Um, but waking up with it every morning, going to sleep with it every night, I'd love to have a vacation. Um, but I know that's not possible. And I know 
it's not really PC for me to say this, but sometimes I would like to go back to simple, a shot a day, a couple of finger sticks a day, real old school. However, I respect and understand the importance of the great research technology that goes on today in today's world of diabetes care. And the end result gives me a 5.9 or a 6.1 H1C, and I love that. Uh, I would say the most important thing is attitude. A good attitude, a good attitude has brought me a gift of wonderful, crazy, wild, adventurous, creative friends with diabetes. I'm very grateful for that. Attitude is my my answer to the challenge. Okay, so I don't. This is category one B because we have exercise, but one B is specifically stretching. And I got to tell you, you know, you try to tell me when I was in my 20s, you should stretch. It's like, get out of town. You know, but as time goes on, it becomes more and more important. You're asking me if I stretch every day and no, but I'm doing it more because I feel like it, it helps so much. And that can literally be just like stretching. I have found the more that I can do it off the ground, the better that, you know, if you tell me that I need to lay down on the ground, that's a little bit harder than just like putting your leg up on something or things that you can do standing because you can do that at work or whatever. Um, but just that's helps to stay limber, help reduce pain, all those kinds of things. What's your take on some stretching? I wish I would have started earlier. I'm still pretty limited, but I stretch in the shower. I put my foot up on a little seat in the shower uh, that uh, Jamie uses to shave her legs. <laughs> she sits down. But also, um, there's a machine at the YMCA. On the top floor, you lay down and you you can measure the angle in mm -hmm. your leg as it get, as it goes up. And you can go up and increase the angle over time. And I agree with you, I don't like getting on the ground because at my age, it's hard to get up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and if you don't want to stretch, like massage, you know, getting that oh. done like once a month, whatever you can fit it in, um, that's not just, you know, glamour, like whatever, that can be very, very helpful therapeutically. And, and there's a private company in San Diego, it's called Stretch. Mm -hmm. And you go in there, you don't, you know, you go in with your clothes, and a trained individual stretches every part of your body. Mm -hmm. It's good because I find when someone else stretches me, they do a better job than when I try to well, stretch. Well, I actually, I was trying to help you stretch the other day and we had a clip of it and it, it didn't go that well, but let's, let's roll the clip. Okay, I'm gonna spin. All right, uh, oh. left foot green. Left foot green. You know what? I don't, I don't think I can do this. And Hey, I don't think this is yoga. I, it definitely is not yoga. Oh, I just pulled something. But it, it, it's kind of fun, though, if you want to keep just playing for a little bit. Sure, All right, sure. There we go. <laughs> right foot. <laughs> I love Twister. And, but I'll tell you what. I don't know if you heard me grunt at the end. I pulled a muscle in my leg. You know, <laughs> I walked around with a limp for a so whole So stretch week. before you stretch. <laughs> it's, re right. it's really important. We don't want to make fun of it, but it is important. Our next big bucket is um, cardiovascular health. And the reason that we really wanted to highlight this, one of the reasons is that when it comes to things like heart attacks and strokes, first of all, that's the number one killer of everybody in the United States, but particularly for people with diabetes. And it's not just about what your cholesterol and blood pressure is today, it's your lifetime risk. How long has it been that high? So we were talking before this, anytime I see a type one that's over 30, I get very serious about putting them on a cholesterol medication, blood pressure if they need it, and people can be resistant to that. They think it you know, means they're not healthy, whatever. Change your mindset. This is about prevention and about you know, kind of tackling the thing that could be your undoing. I always mention this study, and it's kind of a sad study, but uh, for all the gentlemen and the young men that died in the Vietnam War, when they did autopsies, uh, they saw tons of plaque in their coronary arteries. Back then, there wasn't much attention to healthy eating. You know, it was like milk, steaks, and it, it let people, it was like a red bulb, light bulb went off and said, this stuff starts in their 20s. So I would go, I'd lower your 30 to 25. Okay. To your patients. And you know what, it also depends on So you're other. saying people, it took me a while to figure that out. People in Vietnam that died in, in the war, they were very young men and already they had heart disease. Yeah. You want the cliff notes? Well, I just, I was trying to keep up with you. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so it's, it's, it always was sad to me. First of all, they, they passed away fighting 
uh, for our country. That's what I just said. <laughs> and second of all, they, they had serious heart disease. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to give you the basics. Now, the basics have been talked about ad nauseum in many of our lectures because it's so important. And as Jeremy mentioned, um, it's the most common cause of passing away. It's not just type two diabetes. Uh -huh. Jeremy does a lot of work on insulin resistance and cardiovascular risk factors in type one. So, you know, we have to pay attention to that as well. So blood pressure. <clears throat> the one thing I wanna say is um, get your own blood pressure cuff. Nothing worse than go, running to the doctor, making your copay, throw you up on the thing, the nurse, takes the blood pressure, she doesn't have the right size cuff, she drops the pressure too quickly, and she says your blood pressure is 160 over 90. Mm -hmm. Do it at home. And um, what, are the, what are the goals you tell your patients to shoot for? Well, yeah, you know, I'm just reminded of that we actually did a really good podcast on this somewhat recently called the Diabetes Warranty Program. And all these levels, these things that you need to control. And I do like this acronym ABC. For A, you know, taking a baby aspirin if you're over 50 can be helpful for your heart. B, getting your blood pressure down, and I'd say 130 over 80 now. Um, anything higher than that, you should be on medication. C, for cholesterol, and we're really focusing on that bad cholesterol, the LDL. You want that at least below 100, ideally below 70. Met tons of medications now that can be really effective for that. So that ABC, kind of keeping that in mind. And of course you're worrying about your blood sugars and your A1C, you know that. But keep these other things in mind because when it comes to heart disease, guess what? Cholesterol and blood pressure are actually more important than your blood sugars. That, that is true. And your HDL, you know, is the protective cholesterol. You want that high, but that pretty much runs in your genes. Mm -hmm. But exercise and uh, two drinks a day of alcohol can raise your HDL uh, a little bit as well. Triglycerides are a different form of fat. That's, that's the reason why you have to fast when you get your lipids. And typically we try to get less than 200. And what about baby aspirin? What's your advice? Yeah, so I said over 50, you know, is when I would kind of consider it for people. 81 milligrams, you can buy a tub of it at, you know, CVS and just take one of those a day. I get mine at Costco. Okay. And then, you know, you want to say that another reason to have a healthy heart is that can help with, guess what, sexual function, which is our next topic. And again, throwing out that, um, you know, not to overly promote our podcast. Why but we, not? But we did a really good episode with um, a sex uh, therapist. Her name is Janice Rosler, where we go into a lot of detail on how, you know, sex and, and, and not just specifically active sex, sexual relationships are so important to people's overall health. And diabetes can bring some extra issues into that, whether it's actual medical issues like ED or maybe body image issues or just dealing with high or low blood sugars during it. So check out that podcast. And the last thing I'll say is that this is, sex is so important to people's overall just well-being. So when we're talking about aging well with diabetes, it's that you know sex in your relationship is obviously gonna be part of hopefully a happy, healthy life um, long life, and how can you prepare yourself with dealing with issues that come up specifically to diabetes? Yeah, and in the podcast, I, I love the way she refers to diabetes as the third person. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, call it Camilla, or call it Jerry, because uh, the third person in the bedroom. Yeah. It's very practical advice. She's, uh, she not only is a, a mortified sex therapist, she teaches sex therapists. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about men. Um, you know, all men sort of lose some sexual function past the age of 50. And uh, people with diabetes uh, have nerve damage, vascular damage as well. Less commonly in men, it's a hormonal issue. Uh, low testosterone is a cause of erectile dysfunction, but it's not the most common cause. And the therapies, you know, we, we just mentioned them now. We do, during a lecture that she gave uh, with her partner, um, uh, I forgot the name of her partner who gave, Cindy, uh, who gave the lecture, and it's memorialized on our website, actually. Um, you know, there's the ED drugs, Cialis, Viatra, Viagra, Levitra. Then there's injections, mm -hmm. prostaglandins, that it sounds like a Chinese torture, but you inject into the shaft of your penis, and it worked very well. Doesn't hurt, apparently. I haven't done it. There's the erect aid device, where it helps uh, engorge your penis with blood, you put a ring on the bottom. And then lastly, for people where none of those work, they have surgery. You can get a prosthetic put in, even fancy ones where the, you have a little pump in your testicular sac and you pump it up when you're ready and you deflate it 
and you could even get a garage door opener for it. No, that's a joke. <laughs> so I think, you know, the point is, again, that it's so common in men, period, and particularly people with diabetes, it's, it's more common. So kind of getting away from the, like, shame or I'm less of a man or whatever, like these kinds of things that people can really run into. Um, it is a, a couple's issue talking about it, ideally opening openly with your partner or a sex therapist because there are therapies. And what about for, for women? Obviously, other issues. Yeah, well, I am not an expert. However, I've listened to experts, and it's complicated. I think with women, um, a lot of things happen, especially through menopause. They lose estrogen, uh, and they have problems with, you know, secretions, orgasm, painful intercourse, and they are treatable. And that could really cause problems mm -hmm. in the bedroom, for sure. So I, I, I would just recommend a very good gynecologist that deals with women with diabetes, mm -hmm. and they can do hormone replacement therapy. Yeah, and the last thing I'll say about that that Janice was so good about is just overall libido decreases and how can you as a couple you know, talk about um, not just sex, but intimacy. Are there other ways that we can connect that doesn't always have to be you know, physical? And we actually, we asked Janice you know, if she could have one message to give people uh, with diabetes about sex, what would it be? And this is what she said. That message would be that there is help, there's hope, there's a treatment for every single person. Don't give up. You deserve to have a wonderful, fulfilling sex life. There are a lot of great treatments out there for men and for women. If you talk to one healthcare provider and don't get the answers that you want or the help you need, go to somebody else who's more aware and more informed. There are a lot of things you could do. And don't just write it off and say, I guess that's it. That's the end of my uh, sex life. Not true. Thank you, Janice. Mm -hmm. Now, our, our second to last topic is the GI tract. Jeremy asked me, why, why, why the GI tract? Well, I said, well, a lot of the issues that we're going to talk about occur as you get older. And they have affected me in all four areas. Mm -hmm. Why not talk about myself? Um, so the first, first I want to tell you, a lot of people don't realize the GI tract starts in your mouth and ends down here. It's all part of your GI tract. So te teeth and gums. Now, we did an excellent podcast with Dana Foreman, who is my dental hygienist. And I, I'm just going to say this in a nutshell. You got to brush every day, twice a day. You got to floss twice a day. Yes, twice a day. Because if you don't, you're going to get plaque buildup. First it's tartar, then it's plaque. It causes periodontal disease. Your gums pull away from the teeth. And inflammation. What can you say about inflammation and people with diabetes? It's increased in general. What, what can it affect? Oh, it can affect insulin sensitivity for sure. I mean, you know, your heart, all these kinds of things. Yeah, your blood vessels. So inflammation is kind of the root cause of a lot of, of medical problems, to be honest. So starting there and, you know, not to mention very bad breath. Now, what about heartburn? Just to let you know, heartburn comes from when uh, gastric contents from your stomach get sort of go up and they get past a, a sphincter that's supposed to be very tight into your esophagus and it burns. Uh -huh. And it's probably one of the most common problems in the world, but it affects people worse. Um, and so it's really important to treat. Um, you know, what's the, what's the type of condition you get when you don't treat? You get, you get irritation, inflammation. Like called Barrett's esophagus. That's it's it. something that That's can it. lead to actually esophageal cancer, yeah. I wasn't, didn't want you to we say didn't that like, part. We I didn't want to scare that. Well, we didn't plan that ahead. I feel like I'm being like, you know, well, I'm glad I, I got that question right. Barrett's esophagus. That's ready for esophagitis. The next and you know, there's lots of good therapies. You know, you got proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole. You got what we call H2 blockers like philodipine. Uh, then you have, you have things like Tums. And even beyond that, uh, you know, there are other medications, but it's something that you need to control. Mm -hmm. And there's also non-pharmacologic approaches like I gave up a lot of coffee, but not all. I gave up sodas. I drink Mio now, the little flavored drops. And, and I sleep with my head of the bed up a little bit. So all these things have really helped. Yeah, and those, those medications are they're over the counter now, and they, are, they can be extremely effective. Once a day medications with very minimal like, side effects, so. Okay, next below the esophagus, esophagus is the stomach, mm -hmm. gastroparesis caused by uh, living with diabetes for over 10 years. The peristaltic motion of your stomach slows down. 
the contents just sit there, you get bloating, fullness early, causes havoc with your blood sugar, and there are also excellent medications. My favorite is, is one that sounds like champagne, Domperidone, which is uh, not in this country. You have to get it from Canada or mm -hmm. Mexico. Yeah, and I think, I don't know, is it safe to say it's probably the thing with diabetes that bothers you personally the most? I think you're, you know, it's, it's annoying. And the treatments, I know you mentioned that one, there's, there isn't much to do for it, which is kind of frustrating. And it can be really intermittent. It's not necessarily every meal. It's some meals. It's hard to predict. A dose of insulin. It's a. It's. A you got to really watch what you eat. You yeah. know, you, get, you don't want to get too stuffed, things like that. And lastly, uh, the lower part of the GI tract, it also slows down with nerve uh, disease over time, even minimal nerve disease, and constipation. Another very common problem could be worse than people with diabetes. And I did look up the list of drugs for constipation. We do have a ton. Mm -hmm. A ton. And so if, if you really have a serious issue and your, and your family practitioner needs some help, you might want to see a good gastroenterologist. Yeah. The one thing I'll say about all of this is that I find a lot of times patients will come in and say, you know, I went to see this other doctor because I had something. And a lot of providers will just automatically blame it on diabetes. Oh, you have heartburn because you have diabetes or your, your feet hurt because you have diabetes. Maybe that's the case, but it shouldn't always be the default, especially if you, you know, only had diabetes for a short amount of time, your blood sugars are well controlled. Um, Sorry, I was looking, looking for my F-bomb oh, okay. I brought for the show. You <laughs> he, know what? He literally has a little bomb that says F on it. Yeah. Throw, it throw it at me. Um, no, I'll so throw it at the doctor. <laughs> them, but don't let people get away with that. I think sometimes that's a little bit of the providers being lazy and just saying that's just diabetes. Yeah. Okay. Last but not least, keeping up with the latest research in diabetes uh, through TCOID is one of the most effective yeah. ways to do that. I would say that's the whole point of TCOID is advocate for yourself. Be, you know, your best, uh, best advocate. Learning about these things, what might help you control your blood sugars. The people that do the best tend to be the ones that, that come to me and, you know, have suggestions about what do you think about this? What do you think about that? They've already kind of done their, their own research. They're staying kind of engaged. This is a 24-7 disease that can really suck sometimes, um, but we have a lot of things that can help. And things today are a lot better than they were literally a year ago, yeah. if not in certainly five years ago. It's changing rapidly. So kudos to you for listening to this, um, you know, educating yourself, because trust us, it will definitely pay off. Yeah, you, you should know that you should have your first degree relatives get tested for the autoantibodies for type 1, because we do now have a disease-modifying therapy. Mm -hmm. teplizumab or tzl you know if you're if you're living with diabetes for a long time you may be stuck in the mud mm -hmm. open your eyes to the newer basal insulins to jo to jo traceba make sure you think about using one of these hybrid closed loop systems mm -hmm. you know it's not for everybody uh, so you you even need to know about some of the drugs that we use for type 2. Yeah. Last thing I was going to say, inhaled insulin or Frezza. That's something that we hear all the time. My, my provider never mentioned it. They didn't know about it. Yeah. And then we've done a lot of, of, of again, podcast information on these SGLE2s, GLP1s that type 1s can use. We actually did a really good podcast that we recorded, hasn't dropped yet, on weight loss for type 1s and how uh, some of these medicines might help. So stay tuned for that. So to wrap it up, we have another patient that you can introduce that um, has been living with type 1 for a long time and has a lot to say about just this topic of, of staying kind of informed. You know how long Gary's been a type 1? He's been my patient for 50 years. No, he hasn't. <laughs> but Gary's lived with type 1 over 50 years. And he one of the things that he talked about when I asked him, what are the most important things you could give a message about? Let's hear it. Uh, I'm Gary Eleanor. Uh, I live in San Diego. Uh, I have had diabetes since age 15, back in the days when we used test strips to test our um, urine and acetone, uh, and there was nothing more. Very strict diet controlled by a physician. You had really no say as to, other than to follow that diet. I was very brittle, so I had a lot of insulin reactions, and that's been a challenge throughout my life. Um, I think the one main thing I could say, I, I learned to seek out good physicians. I think that's a critical uh, thing to do is to find a physician that you have confidence in and will allow you, the patient, to have a say in your treatment. I have to say I've fired numerous physicians who did not do that uh, because I knew better and I knew I had to have a voice in order to uh, manage this illness. Um, so 
Keeping up with new developments was a key for me. I was very fortunate to select physicians who were leaders in their field um, and could tell me when something new was coming out. Sometimes I would get involved in research studies. All of these new things that have occurred over the years since I was 15 years old are just amazing of my control. Um, I've, I've gone the gamut from, from the P tests all the way up to um, uh, the Dexcom when it first came out, um, the glucose monitoring devices, uh, in, and the um, insulin pumps. All of those have helped me greatly uh, manage my diabetes. So that's pretty much the major things I think that have helped me through the years. Uh, again, uh, having a, a good provider and, and looking at what's new in the field to help advance your treatment and improve it even better. All right, so why are we doing this whole talk? Why did we go through this? Well, guess what? If you haven't heard, people with type 1 diabetes are now living longer than people without diabetes. I'll say that again. We are living longer than people without diabetes because we can take care of ourselves and age well, not just with diabetes, but age well. Yeah, I look pretty good for 85, don't mm -hmm. I? Pretty darn good. So that's it. Thanks for listening. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and we'll see you at the next talk.